started. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So propositional logic, this is uh, the second half of the first lecture. It's still Tuesday. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to do two applications. We're going to do something called knights and knaves problems. And then we'll talk about laws of thought. The knights and knaves. Uh, We can use uh, propositional logic and the truth tables and the rules we've defined so far to help us think about things. So a knights and knaves problem is really just a little riddle. It's a little uh, sort of a, a small problem. And you are trying to uh, determine uh, what, this, what the truth of the scenario actually is. You know, certain th Propositional logic is really good for like, if you have a body of facts and you're trying to deduce what is true, who's lying, who's not lying, things like this. Right? So a knight and knaves problem looks something like this. All knights tell the truth. Tell the truth. Uh, all knaves lie. Always lie. A knave is an old word for like a little jester. So like the guy with the, the hat that looks like a pineapple. Um, so suppose you have two people approach you and you want to determine uh, if they're knights or knaves. So you're a king in a court and two guys come, come up to you. Uh, person A says the following, uh, that B is a knight. And person B, who's standing next to him, says, um, the two of us are opposite types. Now, in this world, everyone is either a knight or a knave. There is no intermediary. So if you're not a knight, you're a knave, right? Um, just to simplify the problem. Because being not a knight in like the real world, you know, if you're not a plumber, doesn't mean you're a carpenter, right? Because then everyone would be carpenters. Uh, but in this world, we may suppose that everyone who's not a knight is a knave, and everyone who's not a knave must be a knight. Everyone has been assigned this by the king. Now, the two guys come into your court, and they say, uh, person A says B is a knight, and person A says the two of us are opposite types. Now, what we're going to do is apply propositional logic to solve this problem. We want to know is A a knight or a knave, or is B a knight or a knave? Here's the problem. Now, person A says B is a knight, but that's only true if A was a knight, right? So like, if B is lying to you, if A is lying to you, then his statement is false. So you can't just take their facts at face value and settle with, well, B is a knight, so A must be a knave, something like this, right? Now. Before rational thinking, you know, what a king would have done is thrown these people into lava. Uh, and the, the development of rationality is, again, in my opinion, one of the greatest achievements of mankind because we don't have to throw these people into lava. We can use propositional logic and very simply deduce what the facts of the case are, even if it's confusing. You know? Logic is relatively new as a science. It's like 1890s, 1870s, something like this. So, you know, calculus millennia old, logic is like less than 200 years old. Um, so what we can do is express these propositions in propositional logic, express them as implications, conditionals, ands, ors, negations, and then trying to deduce from that what the only scenario could be. Right? So let P be the statement, uh, A is a knight. And let... Uh, Q be the statement, uh, the proposition B is a knight. We want to deduce uh, what they're saying. You know, they've given us a set of facts, but their, their facts are conditional on if they're telling the truth or not. By the way, what is not P? P is, a is a knave. Yeah, if, a, if P is a knight, not P would mean A is not a knight. But not being a knight means you're a knave. So person A uh, asserts the following. They, they assert that B is a knight, right? But the, B is only a knight if A is telling the truth, right? So what we may write is not just Q, but P implies Q. 
Do we agree? If A is telling the truth, we, we don't know if A is telling the truth or not. So we can break it up into a conditional. If A was telling the truth, then if he was telling the truth, then this is true. B is a knight. So we know that B, the, the, the proposition Q, B is a knight, is true. Do we agree so far? We've deduced, even though we don't know if A is telling the truth or not, that's okay. We can still express a true statement, the conditional. We say, we can, instead of saying, we don't know if A is telling the truth or not, let's disregard the fact, we can say, if A is telling the truth, then the statement is true. Now, this isn't, isn't the only thing they're saying, right? If A is a knight, if they're telling the truth, then B is a knight. But what if A is not a knight? Suppose they're a knave. There's two cases, right? If they're a knave, then they're not telling the truth. Knaves always lie. But here's the cool thing about lying. If you know someone's a liar, you can take the opposite of what they said, and it must be true. Right? There's that stockbroker guy, the guy on TV, and he's like so wrong about the stock market, people take the opposite of what he says, and they have a, they're winning pretty well. Right? So if someone is always lying to you, if, someone, if you know someone is lying to you, you can compute the negation of their statement and extract truth from them. You know, if someone gets, uh, if you have a true and false quiz and someone gets a zero on it, they actually knew the answer. They knew to mark the opposite. If someone gets a 50-50 on a true and false uh, exam, you know actually they knew nothing. So in some sense, a zero on a true and false exam is a higher score than a 50. Because if someone who gets a 50 really knows nothing, someone who gets a zero knew the answer and wanted to fail. You know how hard you have to try to fail a, a, a true and false question? You have to know the exact opposite answers. Also, you should feel bad if you've ever gotten 50 less than 50 on a true and false answer, because a coin, mean, that means a coin could have done better than you. Um, right, so if, if not P, what do we know is true? Not Q. Not Q, why? If, uh, if uh, A is not a knight, then we know that they're lying to us, right? So we know that the opposite of what they must be saying is true. If they're not a knight, then A then the opposite of B is a knight must be true. Therefore, B is a knave. So we represent that as negation of Q. Right? So that is a fact, independent of the fact that we don't know if A is telling the truth or not. But we have extracted that much knowledge from them without knowing if they're lying or not. That is unconditionally true. Questions on that part so far? Now, uh, we can write the statement of B a little more complicated. Now, we know that... Again, we can break it up into cases. If B is a knight, uh, then they must be telling the truth. Right? Q. If they're a knight, then, there's, then, there's, then they assert that uh, the two of us are opposite types. Now, this is where you have to get a little creative with your bringing some programming intuition. How would you represent the two of us are opposite types using the logical symbols that we know so far? They have to be different. Exclusive or. exclusive or is one way. There's, a, there's another way. Using, let's suppose we don't know exclusive or. Negate P. When you on the, on the negate P. End, on the other end of the, like, Q implies the negated P. Q implies negated P. Uh, I'll exp I think that's correct, but let me, exp let me do it a different way. Right? To, let's express just the statement by itself. The two of them are opposite types. It's the opposite types. So we can say P implies this statement then it'll be easier to take the negation of that. So what that means is both P and Q can't be true, and they both can't be false. They're opposites. So what we mean is like Q, P and not Q, or not P and Q. Would you agree that that asserts that they are opposite types? Any questions on that one? Can you convince yourself that's basically the exclusive or? They're different, okay? Use a square bracket. Now, how do we, what, what happens if B is a knave? Then, what they, then the opposite of the two of us are opposite types is true, correct? Now, we could work through a formula for what that means. How do we express that they're both the same or they're, they're both true or they're both false? We could create such a formula. However, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a secret. The sentence, they're the same type, is the negation of the sentence, they're opposite types. 
So we simply would take the negation of this. But then that's the same as this being an if and only if. Right? If this is false, then this is false. If this is true, then this is true. If and only if there. Questions on that one? That was a slight jump in, in logic, but do we believe that these two statements are true? Great, we've extracted two pieces of knowledge from two people with ambiguous character, but we know truth in this domain. Now, how do we know who's a knight, who's a knave, who's not a knight, who's not a knave, right? So what we can do is simply fill, fill out a truth table. So that's all we're going to do. Uh, P, Q, we use true and false here to represent knight, 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 knave, knave, knight, and knave, knave, right? Now, this is a little tedious to fill out the truth table, but let's do it anyway. P implies Q is going to be what? What is the truth table for P implies Q? False, true, true. Yeah. You got, that one's the only one you should be quick about. The rest of them you can compute. True, false, true, true. Uh, similarly, when is uh, not P implies not Q? Here's a way to do fast uh, this quickly, right? What you could do is have a column for not P, have a column for not Q, and then take the implication of those two columns. What you can simply do is look to these two. You know that P implies Q is false when P is true and uh, Q is false, right? So what you can do is just look when not P is true, not P is true whenever P is false, and not Q is false whenever Q is true. You agree? Just a, a, sort of a quick uh, way you could be able to do that. Now we want to and those two. So what is the and of these two columns? True, false, false, true. True, true, right? So we have the truth table for uh, the statement that A is given, okay? We want to compute the truth table for the other one. So what we're going to do is just kind of put it down here. What is uh, P and not Q? The P and not Q. We'll do uh, not P and uh, Q. We're going to do this truth table tediously on purpose, and we'll show a quicker way to do it. But we need to know how hard it is to know to appreciate how easy the other way is going to be. Um, and then we'll do the and of those two. The, excuse me, the or of those two. What is P and not Q? It's P has to be true and Q has to be false. P has to be true and Q has to be false. Right? If P is true and Q is true, then not true is false. So it's true and false. So this is a false. This is going to be a true. What is this one going to be? False. False. What is this one going to be? False. 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 Uh, not P and Q is true when Q is true and when uh, not P is false. Not when P, not P is true, so when P is false. So it's only true here. Another way to quickly think about this is this is an and. That's like the big one in this expression. Think about the truth table for and. It was true, false, false, false. So this is true. False, false, false. It's just in a different order, right? It's as if you rearrange the rows of the truth table. What is the or of these two statements? False, false, true, false. False, true, true, false. Let me double check. Correct. Um, 
Now, I'm being a little lazy because of the board here, but let's do a Q if and only if that. <coughs> so what you're going to do is take this column, take Q and if and only if them together. What is the output of that column? Check, basically, just check if they're the same. Q is true. Uh, this uh, disjunction is false. So this is a false. Right? This is true. This is false. So this is also false. This is true, and this is true. So this is true. This is false, and this is false. So P if and, a Q if and only if the statement, so this is also true. right? You guys should get good about uh, filling in a truth table pretty quickly. It's easy to mess up, uh, make small mistakes, but we'll we'll uh, we'll show you a, a, another way, right? Now, given that, what do we know about uh, we 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 have the truth table for when A is correct, and we have the truth table for when, when B is correct. But the statements A and B we know are true, even if we don't know if A and B are telling the truth. We've expressed it as a greater uh, combination. So what we can do is just take A and B to mean we know those things are true, so A and B has to be true. Now, the outcomes of this will give us truth values in the uh, table, and that'll tell us when can it be possible that A is telling the truth, or B is telling the truth, or A is lying, or B is lying, right? Anywhere there's a true going to be here is going to be a satisfactory condition that that's a possibility, right? If we only have one outcome uh, in the table in this row, we'll know that that's the only way that it could be. If we have no outcomes in this row, then we know that actually the puzzle's impossible, you know? So we can literally just take the logical and of this fact and this fact. So take the and of these two facts. What is this case? False. False. Second? False. False. Third? False. False. Fourth? So we see it's only true when P and Q are both false. But what does that mean? They're both knaves. They're both knaves. Two jesters showed up in court. None of them are knights. So they both lied. We can use truth tables to, and the syntax and, the, uh, and moving symbols around, pure symbolic manipulation to deduce the fact of the case. Right? Now, we could have done that if we were a little more rational with just by arguing it. So, like, suppose, for example, uh, A says B is a knight, and the two of us are opposite types. So, if we can work through this without a truth table, but maybe a primitive uh, emotional king would throw them into lava. So, we have to, we can deduce the truth without having to delegate to the truth table. But the truth table is always correct, even if our, perhaps our thinking is not. If, B is a, if A says B is a knight, but then B is telling the truth. So we know that A, if A is telling the truth, then B is telling the truth. So then A and B are opposite types. So if A is a knight, then the two of us are opposite types means B is a knave. But if B is a knave, it's lying. So the statement, the two of us are opposite types, is wrong. So A cannot be a knight and B cannot be a knave. So we know that case could be eliminated manually. What about if A is a knave? If A is a knave, then B is a, then B is a knight. So we know that they're lying, so B is not a knight. So the two of us are opposite types is wrong. So we know that if A is a knave, B is not a knight, and is therefore a knave. So the fact that they're two knaves, we don't reach any contradiction in that. So that's a possible case. So of the four outcomes, we could just sort of deduce that the only outcome feasible is that they're both knaves. However, we could do that with pure propositional logic, pure symbolic manipulation. Notice that we didn't actually have to think about this. Moving the symbols around on the board did the thinking for us, in some sense. It's the mechanization of it, right? Any questions on a knights and knaves style problem? There are a few parts to solving little puzzles like this. First is you're given a word problem. You have to deduce how can I translate this into the formal language into formal logic, into symbol, symbols. So we have to say, well, let A, P be the statement, this proposition, Q be this proposition. That's first the hard part, is 
is this translation. Then you have to deduce, even if you don't know who's telling the truth or not, you can still extract something from this. Right? Given this, okay, just when, a, when a, both these statements are true, what is the outcome? Well, we know that there's only one true value here. So that's what we get. Any questions on this Knights and Knaves problem? This is from a book by uh, Robert Smullyan. He has, a, he has a book from the 70s called, 70s? Um, it's called, What is the Name of This Book? And it's just full of like 250 puzzles like this. And although you're not meant to solve them with truth tables, you're meant to sort of work them out. Uh, logically, you know, you can apply propositional logic to solve the puzzles. Right. Any questions like this? Any questions on this one? Okay. Truth tables, uh, as we've seen, are annoying and cumbersome. So let's figure out a way we can not do a truth table. By the way, if you have n propositional variables, what's the dimension of your truth table? n squared? Nope. 2 to the n? 2 to the n. One of those had to be true, right? So think about the number of possibilities if you have, you have to have a row in the truth table for every possible combination. And each propositional variable can be true or false. For every combination, and we'll talk again later about combinatorics, there's two to the n possible combinations of that, right? Where each one is true and each one is true or false, each one is true or false, each one is true or false, right? This was a, two, this was a, four, a, a table of four rows simply because two to the two is four. Imagine if we had three propositional variables, it's going to be of size eight, right? 16, 32, that's big. I don't have room on the board for that. So let's, let's try to avoid the use of propositional variables whenever we can. Instead, we're going to do what's something called applying laws of thought. And laws of thought are themselves just rules. Laws of thought, so like, it's, known, it's been known even since like ancient Greeks. You're trying to deduce truth, okay? Now, you have a set of assumptions, and from those assumptions, those premises, whatever, you extract more knowledge, right? You make conclusions, and you, you, you assert the truth of other statements or the falsehood of other statements, right? But you can't do so unless you have some basic set of premises, right? If you don't know anything, if you know nothing, nothing in this world, can that person deduce truth? No. Truth can only be deduced from other truths, and those truths deduce perhaps from other truths and so on. So you must start with some basic set of premises to work under. And these are actually going to be our laws of thought. The laws of thought are, are a symbolic manipulation. You know, we're going to have, similar to we have arithmetic, uh, you know, when you write a plus b is equal to b plus a, you are applying a law, an axiom, uh, but you're not doing so, you're doing so indiscriminately. You don't really care about what a and b are. But um, that axiom is true simply because it doesn't matter, again, with the banana pushing piles analogy. If you have three bananas and two bananas, you push them into a pile. It doesn't matter which order you put them in. So we may r say that addition is, quote unquote, commutative. Right? Similarly, it may or may not matter what combination you, you combine ideas in. So that's basically all law of, uh, a law of thought is. Now, uh, we say that a law, a law of thought is expressed as an equivalence. So we say um, two propositions. Uh, are equivalent, and we use this symbol equal, equals, if they have the same truth table. Later, we can say two propositions are equivalent if you can apply a, a law of thought to get from one to the other. A plus B is equal to B plus A because you apply the law of thought, or you, when you, because you apply the commutativity of addition. But the way we'll prove uh, equivalence, a law of a thought to be correct, is with a truth table. Right? So let's get through some, uh, some laws of thought. Any, any questions on what we're doing before we get into it? What a law of thought is? Right. So let's suppose you have any proposition P and you conjunct it with truth. What do you know about the proposition? What is this equivalent to? For each law we'll give, I want you to think about the way you think and the way you combine ideas and the way you actually form thought and the way the idea forms out of your brain. 
and say, well, yeah, that sounds right. That's, that does sound like the way I think. That does model the way I think. What is P and true? Where T is a capital T is a truth. It's pure truth. What is P and T? Yeah. Yeah. Do you agree with that? What about uh, P or F? What is P or a falsehood equivalent to? P. P or a falsehood is true exactly when P is true, right? If P is false, this whole statement is false. And if P is true, this whole statement is true. So this is actually the same value as P. You can think of the equivalence of propositional calculus uh, on propositional calculus similar to the biconditional. But the biconditional is a symbol of the propositional calculus. The equivalence represents equality, is of propositional formulas, right? So the biconditional is a symbol of the calculus you use. Like you may express equivalence, and we will today, of biconditionals. Um, these are called the laws of identity. Some of these laws have, the cool thing about being math, you get to use these wizardly like terms. Sometimes things are made up. Uh, and it's not really the most important that you know what the names of certain identities are. But in certain formal proof settings, you'll have to cite the name of the law if you're using it. Right? Um, what about uh, P uh, or T? This is always unambiguously true. What about P and false? This is always false. Right? Convince yourself if you have a body of knowledge and you know P or truth, the whole statement certainly is just already true. Right? These are called domination. Cool magic spell words. Um, more of them will be made up. What about uh, P and P? When is P and P true? When P is true. And when is it false? When P is false. So P and P is exactly simply just P, right? This is analogous to like zero plus zero, right? We're seeing some of the similarities of the, the rules of arithmetic that we use to move things around. What about um, P or P? So another way to think of this, the conjunction and disjunction are a synthesis of ideas. You take two ideas, you combine them, you get a new idea. If you combine, if you combine an idea with itself, you don't get anything. You cannot make a new idea. If you have only one idea, that's it. You can't combine that idea with itself to make more ideas. That sounds true with the way we think. You need a combination of different ideas to make something unique, to make a new idea. Right? These are called uh, idempotents. Uh, negation of negation of P is logically equivalent to what? P, right? This is called double negation. Uh, what do we know uh, P and Q to be logically equivalent to? Notice it doesn't really matter when you synthesize these ideas with conjunction and with disjunction. It doesn't really matter what order you combine the ideas. You have a, a, a collection of ideas, and boop, out pops another idea. But it doesn't really matter what order those were combined in. So actually, we can observe that both disjunction and conjunction are commutative. These are the laws of commutativity. Convince yourself that's true. When we fill in the truth table for P and Q, it didn't really matter what order we did them in. The and, you know, I eat burger and I eat milkshake, is logically equivalent to I eat milkshake and I eat burger, right? Communitivity is true. Questions on that one? Any questions so far? The name of these laws? These are such basic things that they, some of them, you can't really prove them in any way. You just understand that that's where they come from, is the way we think, right? Um, here's a harder one. What do we think if we take P, uh, actually this is not a harder one yet, P and Q and R. Notice that if you have 
three piles of bananas, right? It doesn't really matter what order you push them together. So we say addition is associative. Similarly, the combination of disjunction and conjunction, as long as they're all the same type, is uh, associative. This we could say is as if we took P and uh, Q and R, right? The parentheses means you'll do that first, right? You'll do P and Q, then you'll take the conjunction with R. But it would be logically the same as you took P, Q and R, and then took Q, right? These are the same thing. Uh, similarly, uh, disjunction is also commutative. Oop, e for disjunction. P or Q or R is equivalent to P or Q or R. Okay, here's a uh, challenge one. These are called associativity. What do we think about P and Q or R? Now we have a we have a, a statement here, a, a proposition that is a combination of two different operations we can perform on propositional formula. What? does this remind you of from arithmetic? Distribution. We have a law of distribution, just like we have a law uh, of distribution in uh, addition and multiplication. Right? This is actually P and Q. Oops. P and Q. Or P and R. Yeah. Yes. Similarly, uh, P or Q and R distributes the other way. We get P or Q and P and R. Oh, P or R, yeah. Right. That's the first law that I think uh, you need to be convinced of. Like, that's perhaps not believable from a, a glance. The other one's like, oh, yeah, okay, obviously. But this one is the first one I'm like, wait a minute, you know. What we can do to prove, we can actually assert the truth of this by displaying that they have the same truth table. So what we're going to do is work through a quick truth table and show that they're the same. We'll do it for one of them. We won't do it for both, because the other one will follow just as easily. The reason I don't want to do it for both, we have three propositional variables. How many rows of our truth table will there be? Eight. So we'll do p. Q, R, true, 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 false, true, false, true, true, false, 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 true, true, false, true, false, 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 true, false, 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 yes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, and we want to assert that uh, we'll first we'll do we'll, we'll first do Q or R, right? What is Q or R? The truth table. We'll just go through the two table, the two elements of the table, and or them together. This is going to be true, 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 false, true, 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 false. You agree? Good at filling the truth table. I simply ordered those two row, those two columns. Now I'm going to do P and Q or R, right? So I'm simply going to and this column with this column. So what we're going to do is true and true is true, true and true is true, true and true is true, true and false is false, false and true is false, false, false. And false. Just double check. Yes. Five of the eight. Okay. Now we want to do uh, the distribution. So we'll leave Q or R here, and we need what? We need. Q. 
Yes. Wait. Make sure I'm doing the right one. We need P or Q. No. Hold on. Sorry. We're trying to show that uh, P and Q or R is equivalent to P and Q or P and R, right? So we need P and Q, yes. P and Q, we're going to look to the columns and just add them together. True, true, false, 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 false. Then we need P and R. That's going to be true, false, true, false, 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 false. Right? Now we need um, di or these two together. Right? So what is the and of these two, excuse me, the or of these two columns? True, 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 false. False, 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 right? So we see we have three trues, five false, three trues, five false. So the distributive law is true. They're equivalent in a truth table sense. Now, every time you want to apply the distributive law, you won't have to uh, do the truth table for it. You can simply just say by distribution, there you go. All right. Let's do some more interesting laws. What do we think about uh, the negation of P and Q? If P and Q is I ate burger and I ate milkshake, not. What does that mean? Logically, we know that I didn't eat a burger. I did not. I didn't eat burger and I didn't eat milkshake. Excuse me. Not, I ate burger, I ate milkshake. So we know that, did you eat a burger or not eat a burger? Could have. But one of those is not true. You either didn't have a burger or you didn't have a milkshake. You could do, couldn't have had both. So what we say is, this is not P or Q. Not Q. Right. Do you guys know the name of this law? The Morgan's Law. One of the most important laws in computer science. The Morgan's Law. Basically, one, two ways to think of this. One, you could work out the truth table for it. But as we saw, that took a little bit of time. So I'm not going to do it. Perhaps you should. It's going to be in the notes. Uh, two, it's just as if you distribute the negation. When you distribute the negation through the parentheses, you have a, almost like you have a distributive law. It has to flip the sign. This is such an essential part of computer science. The negation of P and Q is either it's, it's either not P or it's not Q. That's, when this, that's exactly when it's true. So those two are equivalent. Now, what would you guess uh, the negation of P or Q is? Not P and not Q. Not P and not Q. When you distribute the uh, negation through the parentheses, it negates everything internally, but then it flips the sign. Right? These are called the Morgan's Laws. Here's another one. What about uh, P or P and Q? What do we think P? Think about this, the truth of this in terms of P and Q. Right? This one's a little challenging. Question. What is that equivalent to? If we were to rewrite that, perhaps simpler, perhaps more complex. Yes. P or P in parentheses, and then and P or Q. What is P or P in parentheses? Ah, see, see, yes. Actually, we'll, we'll do that as an example. You simply applied 
the distributive property. But what do you know about P or P? It's P. Yes. So in fact, I'll tell you this is just P. If P is true, it's true. If P is false, it's false. So P or P, right? Well, this is a non, not an easy one, I think, and we'll prove this. We use an, we'll do an example of this using the laws of five. And then similarly, a P and a P or Q is going to be P, right? In some sense, when you combine ideas, you need to have unique ideas. If you combine an idea with itself in a combination, maybe nothing nice comes out, right? In fact, the Q here ends up being redundant. That's basically what these laws say. These are called absorption. Absorption, not absorption, absorption, right? There are a few laws with implication. We have P implies Q is equivalent to what did we say with ands, ors, and nots? Do we remember? What is P implies Q logically equivalent to? P or Q. Not P or Q. There's a name for this law. It's called conditional disjunctive equivalence. Right. We also have another law, P implies Q is actually logically equivalent to the contrapositive. Not Q implies not P. Right? So if uh, you study, then you'll pass. You didn't pass. That means you didn't study. We can also work this out with the truth table. P, Q, uh, true, 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 false, false, true, false, false. We have P implies Q. What's the truth table for P implies Q? Quick. True, false, true, true. P, not P, is going to be false, false, true, true. Not Q is going to be. What is not Q implies not P? This, these are, conditionals are always the hard one because there's, there's a dependence upon them. So look to not Q and then see when it goes that way, right? So we have true, false. That's the only time it's false, right? So that's a false here. And the rest of them, they must be true because it's a conditional, right? So actually, look, true, false, true, 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 false, true, 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 false, true, true. So we know that the, the uh, statement is equivalent to its... Um, let's see, to its conditional, right? It's, excuse me, a conditional is equivalent to its contrapositive. P implies Q, logically equivalent to not Q implies not P. Um, here's some others. P or Q we can express as a conditional. How would you express P or Q as a conditional? The idea is P, and Q, P or Q is not necessarily, there's a dependence upon each other, but you can, a conditional implies a dependence. This is an outcome of this, right? But these two ideas may be not connected, but they can be expressed with a connection. How would you write P or Q using an implication? Not P implies Q? Yes. Convince yourself that it's true just from this first one. Substitute it in P for not P, the same thing. Right. Uh, one more. What do we know about P and Q? This one is a little hard, but can be demonstrated using the laws or truth table. I'll tell you, this is not P implies not Q. That one seems a little, a little useless. 
But you can always express, sorry. It's good, better. You can always express a law in terms of an and or or in terms of conditional. But, in that, but more importantly, you can express conditional in terms of and and ors, right? Here's some more. What do we know? What can we represent not P implies Q as? What is that logically equivalent to? What you should do, take the truth table for P implies Q, negate it, and try to think what combination makes that. Right? So not P implies Q is what? Correct. I'll tell you that's simply P and not Q. Here's what we're gonna, the way we're going to apply the loss. Not P implies Q, you know, is going to just be by conditional disjunctive equivalence is what? Replace the conditional with... Not, not P or Q. Not the parentheses, not P or Q. Right? Now what you're going to do is apply De Morgan's law. We see? Just a combination of other ideas. This is not itself a law. This is not something you can use, but it's certainly true. Here's another one. What do we know about uh, if P implies Q and that uh, P implies R? This is equivalent to P implies what? P implies Q and P implies R. If P is true, what is true? Don't think about truth tables for this one. Just think about the way you connect ideas. Q and R. Right? If P implies Q and P implies R, then P implies Q and R. If P is true, both Q and R are true. Right? Here's another one. Uh, what do we know if uh, P implies R and Q implies R? Then what implies R? P and Q. Yeah. P or Q. Oh. Only one of those must be true. Now, you could prove these with truth tables. Not doing it for simply the lack of time. But certainly if P is true, then R is true. If Q is true, R is true. So if P or Q is true, then R is true. That's the connection, right? Uh, what about um, P implies Q or P implies R? P implies what? Q or R. Q or R. One of those is true, right? If you go to McDonald's, you will order a burger. Or if you go to McDonald's, you order a milkshake. If you go to McDonald's, you order a burger or a milkshake. That's just the way, without doing the truth table, that's just simply the way the thought occurs in your head, right? Um, final one of these, I promise. P implies R or Q implies R. We know what implies R. For the previous one, when it says P implies Q or P implies R, is, does that mean like it can only imply one at one time? Or? Not necessarily true. When we combine ideas like this, the or, remember, could be both. P implies Q or P implies R. It could be only one. It could be both. But it can't be neither. You go to McDonald's, you're getting the burger or you're getting the shake. So then when we say that in English, it's like, well, you go to McDonald's, you get the burger or the shake, right? If P implies R and Q, or Q implies R, what implies R? P or Q. P or Q? P and Q. How does that one? That one should surprise you. P, if P implies R, then P implies R. 
Uh, but if Q implies, if true, Q is true, then Q implies R. This might be one of those times where uh, working within a formal system of calculus, like moving symbolically, moving symbols around, can tell you something about your own thought. This is true because I worked out the truth table, and the truth table says it's true. I'm 99% certain there's no error here. But when you say sentences out loud, it's not obvious that, that that's correct. And even I think it should be P or Q implies R, but it's actually both. When you work out the truth table, it's actually both. So, you know, like in science, you have uh, a good scientific theory should explain all previous uh, evidence, but also should be able to make future predictions. You know, you have a physics formula. It can tell you about a situation that never happened. You know, same thing here. It, it can tell you about the way thought should be formed, even if that thought never occurred. Right. So perhaps just believe me on this one. This one's true. Um, we have a few laws for biconditionals. Uh, P if and only if Q is equivalent to P implies Q and uh, Q implies P. We have uh, P if and only if Q is equivalent to not P if and only if not Q. Both of those you should believe to be true, right? P if and only if Q is equivalent to, they're both true or they're both false. So the way we would represent that as P and Q or not P and not Q. And one more, um, if P, if not P if and only if Q, then this is equivalent to P implies what? If this is good training in, in logic, right? This is the reason we're going through this. Not Q. If it's not true that P if and only if Q, then if P occurs, then we know that actually Q must not have occurred at all. So it's not Q. Right? Two more quick ones. What about uh, P or not P? True. True. Do you anyone know the name of this? P or not P. We know, you know, anciently everything is either true or false. So that is uh, true. Everything is being either true or false is true. So there's a name for this. It's called a tautology. Cool part about math, made up spell words. What about P and not P? What is that logically equivalent to? False. P or uh, not P is always true. P and not P is always false. Something cannot be both true and false simultaneously. This is called a contradiction. And it's basically our law of excluded middle. There's nothing that is both true and false simultaneously. Anything that is not true must be false. Right. So these are tautologies and contradictions. Suppose we wanted to now use the laws of thought. Like, suppose we, we did this one here. Not P implies Q uh, is equivalent to P and not Q, right? Suppose we wanted to actually demonstrate that with the laws. We sort of did the shorthand to, to, to brief you on how that works. But we can apply the laws of thought. What you're going to do first is you're going to start with uh, your premise, which is not P implies Q, OK? Then what you're going to do is go down in a line, and you're going to explain why the following line follows, right? So this, I claim, is not, not P or Q. And why is that true? What's the name of the law? Conditional. Yeah. Conditional, big word. Conditional, disjunctive. 
equivalence. Now, I claim this is equivalent to not, not P and not Q, right? What's the name of this law? De Morgan's law. This is De Morgan's law. All right. Now we have one more step to go. What is it? Double negation. Yes. We're going to say not not P. That's just P. Double negation. When you're actually doing scratch work, it's OK not to name the laws. But when you're turning in something, at least from the first unit, you'll have to, you'll have to cite, like, when is, what, why is this true? You know? the, gr the greater is not going to be, it's not going to be, the, the greater is going to pretend it's not obvious to them why something's true, right? Doing two quick shorthands may not be uh, appropriate. One quick shorthand may be OK, right? So, well, we're done. We proved, uh, therefore, not P implies Q, not P implies Q, is equivalent to P and not Q. So we were able to assert truth in that sense by applying symbolic manipulation the same way you apply distributive laws, commutative laws of addition and multiplication. We were able to assert an equivalence between two statements without having to actually write at the truth table. This is excellent because if you have so many variables, you don't want to write truth table. It's too big. This is simpler. Just applying the, the way thought is translated and formed in your head, you can get the right answer out. Right. Any questions on this? Do another one. Suppose we want to assert that uh, P and Q implies P or Q is a tautology. We want to prove that this is always true. So what we're going to do is just start with P and Q implies P or Q and deduce using the laws of thought that it is true, right? Not that it's truth is some, a function of some other propositional formula, but that it is true. Again, tautology is something that's always true. Right. So we'll start with the state, with the, with the premise. P and Q implies P or Q, right? Now, uh, what is the first thing we should do? This is sort of always the challenge. You have to know what order to apply the laws in. What would be the first law you would think to apply? Let's get to that implication. It's ugly. All right, it's conditional disjunctive equivalence. And we'll say this is what? Not P and Q or P or Q. Right. Notice you apply conditional disjunctive equivalence. You negate the entire thing, right? Then later you have to apply some more laws. But that's what conditional con disjunctive equivalence says. It doesn't say you get to nest things down, right? Uh, what do we know about this? What's the next law we should apply? De Morgan's. De Morgan's. Let's apply De Morgan's. So we're going to get what? Not P or not Q or P or Q, right? Is De Morgan's? What's the next law we should apply? Commutative. Notice that all these are ors. So actually, we can by commutativity we can just rearrange things, oh. right? So what do we? What, let's put the p's together. P or p, or q. Or, no, excuse me. Not p or p or not Q or Q. Commutativity. And technically associativity here, because we rearrange things. Um, what is not P or P? Mm -hmm. Yes, tautology. Not Q or Q is also a tautology. Here, the name of the law would be... Um, if I had to say the name of the law, right. 
it would be domination. Therefore, P and Q implies P or Q is always true, right? Now, intuitively, you also should believe that's true. Uh, all right, that's all I have for you. Be around after class if you have some questions.